As rulers who committed unforgivable and ruthless acts, many dictators have become targets of worship or hate even after death. From being embalmed for eternal display, to being stolen from a burial site, to being moved from one burial site to another, here's what happened to the bodies of some of the most notorious dictators. Forced to flee his country, his allied forces started making their way up the Italian peninsula. Benito Mussolini tried to escape to Switzerland with his mistress, Clara Petacci, and a few German guards on April 25, 1945. Though dressed up in German clothes, years of public propaganda had made the infamous Il Duce immediately recognizable. Two days into their journey, Mussolini and Patacci were captured by communist partisans and, on April 28, 1945, were executed by firing squad. The two corpses were then hung upside down by a gas station in Milan, where crowds gathered to curse, spit, kick, and defile them. After a fraught, emotional public display of outrage at the dictator who had led so many Italians to their deaths, Mussolini's body went into an unmarked grave, but according to NPR, was dug up by neo-fascists and stolen just a year later. The brief debacle ended when Italian authorities quickly arrested the thieves and hid the body in a Milan monastery for over a decade. But Mussolini's corpse wasn't finished moving around quite yet. Finally, in 1957, Mussolini's wife got it transferred to the family mausoleum at Perdapio, where it receives 100,000 visitors a year. With his dictatorship ending, Nazi leader Adolf Hitler killed himself along with new wife Eva Braun on April 30, 1945. As explained by Smithsonian, Hitler didn't want the same end as Mussolini and ordered his and his wife's bodies to be burned after their deaths. The charred remains were discovered by Russian troops just a few days later on May 5th. After taking some photographs of the remains, the Russians supposedly buried them in a secret location, then later dug the remains up and buried them in another secret location, where they remained for 25 years. In 1975, the head of the KGB ordered for Hitler and Braun to be dug up so their burial site wouldn't become, quote, a pilgrimage for fascists. The corpses were burned to ash and dumped into the Biederitz River, but the Soviet Union kept a part of Hitler's jaw on a portion of his skull. While some claim that the skull is actually a woman's, despite Moscow rejecting that claim's validity, the teeth have been identified as Hitler's and the remains are held in the Russian state archive to this day. Though now widely considered a ruthless dictator who sent millions of fellow citizens to their deaths, when Joseph Stalin died in 1953, the Soviet leader received ceremonies fit for a hero. For three days, his body went on temporary display at the Hall of Columns. Thousands rushed to catch a glimpse, with an estimated 500 people reportedly dying in the mayhem. Following the viewings, the Soviet Union then sought to preserve and display Stalin's body as had been done with Vladimir Lenin's corpse. Embalmers worked hard for seven months to prepare Stalin's body for long-term display, and in November 1953, the corpse was placed near Lenin's in the mausoleum at Moscow's Red Square. In the years following his death, however, Soviet leaders began opening up about Stalin's brutality, acknowledging his role in the mass killings of Soviet citizens. In October 1961, just eight years after he died, the body was quietly removed from the mausoleum and buried 300 feet away in an area half-hidden by trees. A simple gravestone marked the site, inscribed with just the line, J.B. Stalin, 1879-1953. A bust of the former Soviet leader was added in 1970. After winning the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, Francisco Franco established a fascist dictatorship over Spain and ruled until his death in 1975. As the country transitioned into a democracy, his body was embalmed and buried in a mausoleum northwest of Madrid called the Valley of the Fallen. The locale holds the remains of combatants from both sides of the Spanish Civil War. But with Franco buried there, as the BBC reports, the site is a shrine for Spain's far right to pay homage to the dictator. Yet it also became a hated location for others who saw it as glorifying Franco and his rule. So in 2019, the Spanish government approved efforts to exhume Franco's body and move it elsewhere, despite resistance from Franco's family and right-wing political parties. In October of that year, the Spanish dictator was reburied at El Pardo Mingo Rubio Cemetery, next to the El Pardo Palace near Madrid that had been his official residence. On September 9, 1976, founder of Communist China Mao Zedong passed away. His passing was sudden and little preparations were in place. Though the communist chairman had requested his body be cremated, his widow Jiang Xiang and several high officials decided he would join Lenin and Ho Chi Minh in being embalmed, as reported in The Guardian. After a tense, complicated process, Mao's body was finally put on permanent display at a grand mausoleum in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. There, in Chairman Mao Memorial Hall, lies Mao's preserved corpse, draped in a red flag emblazoned with a hammer and sickle, with his face illuminated by an eerie red light. After ruling Romania for a quarter of a century, Nicolae Ceausescu was ousted in a violent anti-communist revolt in 1989. Betrayed by his pilot as he tried to flee by helicopter, the dictator and his wife Elena were executed by firing squad on Christmas Day at a military base outside of Bucharest. 
The graphic ordeal was recorded on video, with disturbing footage of the couple weeping and begging for mercy even airing on French television. Ceausescu was a dictator. If you consider all the atrocities he committed, I'd say only one charge was possible – crimes against humanity. The former dictator and his wife were allegedly buried about 65 feet apart in the Gentia military cemetery, and doubts eventually surfaced as to whether both bodies were actually there. According to the BBC, in July 2010, after years of demands from the couple's children, their bodies were exhumed and DNA tests conducted to confirm their identities. In November of that year, it was confirmed that the remains were indeed Nikolai Ceausescu's, though there wasn't enough material to confirm Elena's identity. Ultimately, the Ceausescu's remaining child, Valentin, then in his 60s, was satisfied with the results. Pol Pot and his communist Khmer Rouge government controlled Cambodia for less than four years, from 1975 to early 1979 but an estimated 2 million Cambodians died during his brutal rule. Even after the Vietnamese took over the area, the dictator remained the head of the Khmer Rouge forces, who had retreated into the jungle as guerrilla fighters. But by 1997, he was overthrown in an internal power struggle and put under house arrest by his own men. On April 15, 1998, Pol Pot died in his sleep due to heart failure. As reported by the Phnom Penh Post, his death came hours after the Khmer Rouge leadership had decided to hand him over to an international tribunal. The coincidental timing spurred rumors that he had actually killed himself to avoid being taken alive, according to the BBC. Ultimately, after being briefly embalmed and put on public display as proof of his death to the world community, Pol Pot's body was cremated without an autopsy. After leading a military coup, Augusto Pinochet ruled Chile from 1973 to 1990 in a reign marked by massive human rights abuses. While Pinochet was forced to step down from presidency in 1990, he remained as commander-in-chief of the army until 1998, the same year that he was arrested in London at the urging of Spain. By then, the former dictator was 83, and his old age and ill health would often be cited as reasons for him not to stand trial for human rights abuse, fraud, and corruption charges, as reported by NBC News. Though after years of wrangling in the courts, it was finally decided that Pinochet would indeed stand trial for his crimes. Before any legal proceedings could begin, the Chilean ex-dictator died on December 10, 2006. Denied a state funeral but granted a military one, Pinochet's body was cremated and his ashes were given to his family to be buried in Santiago. After Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein was executed by hanging on December 30, 2006, his body was swiftly transported by a U.S. aircraft to Awaja, his home in the village of the Tikrit region of Iraq, north of Baghdad. Entombed in a lavish mausoleum since 2007, the former Iraqi leader's corpse was moved to a secret location in early 2014 amid fears that it would be vandalized. According to Reuters, the cautionary move was justified by subsequent events when, in August 2014, Shiite militiamen broke into the gravesite, tore down photographs of the former Iraqi leader, and then set the area on fire. Just a few months later, in March 2015, the entire mausoleum was nearly completely leveled by further conflict in the area, as reported by the BBC. Captured and executed by National Transitional Council, or NTC, fighters, Muammar Gaddafi died of gunshot wounds in an ambulance on its way to a Misrata hospital on October 20, 2011. Hated by many Libyans, the dictator's body was gracelessly placed on a dirty mattress inside a meat storage freezer. Hundreds of people visited to confirm his death with their own eyes, as described by ABC News, while leaders debated what to do with Gaddafi's corpse. His body lay in that freezer for four days before the NTC finally readied to move the corpse on October 24. Rejecting requests from Gaddafi's tribe to bury him in his hometown of Sirte, the NTC instead opted for a secret location in the desert to prevent his supporters from making the grave a shrine. In power for 17 years after the death of his father and national founder Kim Il-sung, North Korean dictator Kim Jong-il died suddenly on a train on December 17, 2011. His body was then embalmed and put on display in the Kumsu Som Mausoleum, in the same manner as those of many other communist leaders. The nod to the same style used in presenting Mao's corpse is pretty direct, with Kim's preserved body apparently tucked under a red blanket, with a spotlight illuminating his face and a room bathed in, yep, you guessed it, red. When the preserved corpse was first presented to a few select visitors in 2012, ABC News reported that widely recognized personal belongings of his were on display, including the parka, sunglasses, and pointy platform shoes he famously wore in the last decades of his life. The body, placed just a few floors away from Father Kim Il-sung's body, is now open for viewing to the public. Once revered as a hero and leader of Zimbabwe's independence movement against the legacies of colonial domination, Robert Mugabe's legacy was tainted by his authoritarian rule as president for over three decades. 
Despite once boasting that, quote, only God could actually remove him from the seat of power, Mugabe had to eat his words when in 2017, he was forcefully ejected from office by members of his own political party at the age of 93. Mugabe spent his final years between Singapore, where he received treatment for cancer, and his residence in Zimbabwe's capital city, Harare. On September 6, 2019, Mugabe died in Singapore at the age of 95. After a state funeral, which, according to the BBC, didn't have an enormous attendance, the location of where the former leader would be buried became a point of debate between the government and his family. But it's also the moment they'll make their final judgment of the man and his legacy. While the government wanted Mugabe to be buried in Zimbabwe's National Heroes Acre Monument in Harare, it eventually agreed to the family's wishes to bury Mugabe at his rural home in Kutama. Still, as reported by CNN, traditional chiefs in the country continued to demand that the ex-dictator be exhumed and reburied at the National Heroes Shrine. Over 2,000 American servicemen were killed. And more than eight decades later, the government is still trying to identify those we lost in the catastrophic blitz on Pearl Harbor. On December 7, 1941, the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, was subjected to a surprise attack from 353 Japanese aircraft, hurling America into World War II. The devastation was unprecedented. A total of 1,177 men were killed aboard the USS Arizona alone, the greatest loss of life of those who served aboard ships in Pearl Harbor. Only 334 of the ship's 1,511 crewmen survived. According to the National World War II Museum, a bomb pierced the Arizona's forward powder magazine, creating a hellish inferno. Eighty years later, one survivor told the Today Show, Where we were, we were high, and I could see all of Pearl Harbor. Wow. We would see the planes flying. We were here to boom. Of the victims on the USS Arizona, only 107 bodies could be identified. The remaining 1,070 were classified as either not found, not identifiable, or unreachable due to where they were located within the ship. Just months after the attacks, U.S. government officials decided that the Arizona would be kept in place in the harbor and designated as a mass gravesite since it would be too difficult to remove the bodies with the respect and dignity the servicemen deserved. Today, the Arizona remains at the bottom of the harbor as a sacred site of pilgrimage with the white, wing-like building constructed above it welcoming 1.7 million visitors per year. According to the National Park Service, which operates the visitor center atop the vessel today, the sinking of the USS Arizona represented the greatest loss of life in American naval history. One survivor of the attack told the History Channel, The fire from the Arizona was so intense, these guys that fell over, came up, got the film on their bodies, were like human torches. As cruel as fate was for those who died aboard the USS Arizona and their families, it was in one respect even worse for the 429 sailors killed aboard the USS Oklahoma and their survivors. Hit by eight torpedoes in the first 10 minutes of the attack, it capsized two minutes after the first barrage. The USS Oklahoma then became an upside-down, pitch-black steel prison for those trapped in its hull. As mortician Caitlin Doty told The Mirror, For the families of those that died aboard ships like the USS Oklahoma, there is no closure as no wreck remains of the battleship. The remains of the men who had died trapped in her overturned hull were retrieved in haste as the ship's parts were salvaged. Unfortunately, this resulted in caskets that many times contained the remains of several men jumbled together. As for the ship itself, the Oklahoma later sank in the middle of the Pacific as it was being towed to its final salvage point on the west coast. A memorial at Pearl Harbor's Ford Island dedicated to those who died aboard the overturned ship is the only site where relatives can pay their respects to the men lost aboard the Oklahoma. A dreadnought of the Colorado class, the West Virginia, weighing 32,000 tons, was hit by two bombs and seven torpedoes on December 7th. As the Naval History and Heritage Command relates in its history of Pearl Harbor, although more than 100 men were lost in the attacks, the skillful maneuverings of the mortally wounded Captain Mervyn Binion, who issued orders even as he lay dying, ensured that the ship remained upright as it sank, sparing its crew from being trapped upside down. Some were nevertheless trapped in sealed compartments inside the burning ship. According to the Dictionary of American Fighting Naval Ships, the bodies of 70 men were found when the ship was refitted and repaired two years later. In a chilling and macabre discovery, 
A calendar that was found amongst the human remains showed that days had been marked off every day after the attack until December 23rd, more than two weeks after the attack. Despite the loss of so many men, there were many stories of heroism from the West Virginia. Many of the survivors were forced to dive into the oily water, which in places had caught on fire, while one ensign who was ashore at the time of the attacks swam to the ship to help save as many people as possible. Sustaining hits from both torpedoes and bombs in the attack at Pearl Harbor, the USS California nevertheless took two days to sink to the bottom of the harbor. But her men were valiant in their attempts to fight the attacking Japanese. No less than four sailors and one officer from the California were awarded the Medal of Honor, the most prestigious military award in the U.S. The National World War II Museum states that Ensign Herbert Jones, the most senior officer aboard when the attack occurred, saved one sailor from a smoke-filled compartment before being mortally wounded in another blast. He refused to be evacuated or attended to while so many other men had been killed aboard the ship. Although her salvage and repair took more than two years, this ship, which had lost almost 100 of her sailors, returned to combat, taking part in several major battles before the war's end. The Utah, which had been decommissioned by the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, was targeted in error by a Japanese pilot. Six torpedoes were wasted on the ship, which would not have taken part in any battles in the Pacific anyway, and 58 men were killed, either after being trapped in the hull or when they tried to swim ashore through the burning oil atop the water. And when they hit, they did catastrophic damage to the ship. The Utah is one of three warships considered total losses from the attack. Along with the Arizona, she still lies in her berth in Pearl Harbor, with the bodies of some of her men aboard. For decades, there was no recognition whatsoever of the dead whose remains are on the ship. According to the Honolulu Star Bulletin, when Utah survivor Chief Yeoman Albert Wagner visited the wreck in subsequent years, he stated, There was nothing but mud then, and no indication that there were men still aboard. Incredibly, that was the case until 1972, when a concrete pier and memorial slab were dedicated at the site. Now, Navy sailors raise and lower a flag each day in respect for the fallen whose remains are entombed there. A direct hit on the USS Shaw became one of the iconic images of Pearl Harbor. The Shaw, which was the target of multiple bombings from the brutal second wave of the attack, took hits to her machine gun platform, forecastle, main decks, and the crew's mess room. Coming at 7.55 on a Sunday morning, the attacks undoubtedly killed many as they ate breakfast on board. Her forward ammunition magazines were ignited approximately 30 minutes after the attacks, resulting in an immense fireball. The Shaw was soon engulfed in flames, and the captain subsequently ordered his men to abandon ship. Many leaped overboard and were able to save themselves, but 24 men succumbed as a result of the bombings and the all-consuming fires from the explosion of the magazine. Despite the extensive damage, the USS Shaw was back at sea in a matter of months, earning no fewer than 11 battle stars. The USS Pennsylvania, a sister ship to the Arizona, was much more fortunate than her dreadnought sibling. Sustaining few direct hits, her crew has the distinction of being some of the only servicemen who were able to open fire and counterattack the Japanese planes that day. A survivor from the ship said in 2021, It was instant confusion. Had scrabble confusion. The Pennsylvania was repaired so quickly that she left Pearl Harbor less than two weeks after the attack, despite being strafed by Japanese bombers. A bomb destroyed her entire five-inch gun mount, killing all the crew members manning it. Altogether, the Pennsylvania lost 15 officers and men, with 14 listed as missing in action. The Pennsylvania was able to sail to San Francisco by December 20th, however, where she underwent repairs before taking part in further action in the war. The USS Nevada, Helena, Curtis, Chu, Dobbin, Enterprise, Maryland, Pruitt, Sicard, Tracy, Vestal, Downs, and Tennessee were among the other ships that sustained casualties amongst their crews in the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor, with 535 servicemen killed in all. The Nevada, weighing 27,500 tons, was the only ship at Pearl Harbor able to get underway after the attacks began. Because of this, she was subject to furious attacks. She beached after losing 50 officers and men, but later was able to be salvaged. She went on to take part in the invasion of Normandy, among other notable battles. Sadly, 
She was later used as part of the atomic bomb tests at Bikini Atoll and was so radioactive she had to be sunk. And despite the loss of 33 men, the crew of the USS Helena had the distinction of shooting down no less than six Japanese dive bombers after the attack began amidst her fierce counterattack that saw the Helena unleash an incredible 375 shells. Many bodies recovered from the warships in the harbor after the horror of that day were interred in Pearl Harbor's National Memorial Cemetery, located near the harbor. Later DNA tests were able to identify 70 men who had perished on the USS Arizona, and additional testing was used to sort through the graves of victims from the USS Oklahoma as well. Following the attack, the government decided that all remains found on the Oklahoma be collected into sets of as many bones for each skeleton as possible. This resulted in many remains being mixed together with those from other victims. In 2003, DNA tests were performed on one casket which was believed to hold Eldon Wyman, whose remains were only recovered two years after the attack during a salvage operation on the Oklahoma that recovered the remains of 381 victims. DNA tests positively identified his remains, but also discovered that the casket actually held the remains of 90 different servicemen. The positive identification of Wyman's remains was a watershed moment in identifying the remains of the Oklahoma servicemen. First interred in small cemeteries, all the remains of the 429 dead from the USS Oklahoma were later taken to the Central Identification Laboratory at Hawaii's Schofield Barracks in 1947. However, only 35 men were able to be identified at that time, using traditional methods such as dental records and dog tags. The creation of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency in 2015 enabled many of the dead to be identified, as researchers from the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory worked with families and descendants living all over the U.S. It's been wildly successful. John Byrd, the lab's director, told Politico, We've identified over 90% of these individuals, but the work isn't done. The success has given hope for the eventual identification of the 45 unidentified men whose remains were found in the USS California and the USS West Virginia. I don't think families ever can get closure, but they, they can get answers. Because of the great respect that must be shown to the dead whose remains are interred forever in the Arizona and other wrecks at Pearl Harbor, only a few, specially chosen divers have the privilege of exploring the harbor. Some of them are even given the somber duty of placing the ashes of servicemen who choose to be interred in these ships along with their fallen crewmates. PN Online, the journal of the paralyzed veterans of America, states that its members also dive at the sites of the Pearl Harbor wrecks as part of an annual event to commemorate the dead, to monitor the decay rates of the ships, and to note the position of objects in the debris field and to check on the environmental impact of the wrecks since the Arizona is still leaking oil. All the Pearl Harbor shipwrecks, along with the remains of the 180 aircraft that were lost that day, are under the auspices of the National Park Service, which ensures that the watery graves of the brave servicemen who gave their lives that day are treated with the proper respect. Unknown deaths, bodies turned into specimens, and water being a death sentence? The bodies at Hiroshima and Nagasaki went through so much more than you think. There are a ton of numbers that are thrown out there when it comes to the death tolls of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. The most off-sited are between 110,000 and 210,000 for the two cities combined. Science says the Hiroshima bombing claimed between 90,000 and 120,000 lives, while Nagasaki suffered between 60,000 and 70,000 deaths. In 1946, the Manhattan Project's chief medical officer, Colonel Stafford Warren, testified before Congress and explained that population records were iffy. No one knew who had died or simply fled in the chaos. He summed up his investigation like this. I am embarrassed by the fact that we could not come back with any definitive figures that I would be able to say were more than a guess. In her book, Suffering Made Real, American Science and the Survivors at Hiroshima, University of Pennsylvania sociologist Susan Lindy writes that when it came time to count how many had died, many were simply gone. Scores of people who were at the epicenter of the blast had been instantly turned to dust and ash and scattered on the wind. Others had headed to the rivers to try to stop the burning and the pain, and when they died there, their remains were carried out to sea. When Colonel Warren gave his statement to Congress in 1946, he said that there was only one concreteish number that he could attest to after months of study. Nagasaki's official records listed 40,000 bodies that had been cremated, 
Warren suggested that another 20 to 30,000 bodies had been unrecovered for various reasons, with many cremated by the uncontrolled raging fires that swept through the city in the aftermath of the blast. Others were permanently buried by debris and destruction. Masako Wada was still a toddler when the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki and recalled that beside their home was a vacant lot used for mass cremations. In an article published by the Union of Concerned Scientists, she recalled, The corpses were cremated day and night. My mother became desensitized to the smell and the sheer number of people in front of her eyes. She said that everybody became numb to what was happening. What is human dignity? Should human beings be treated like that? We are not created to be burned like garbage. Bones and ash littered cremation sites for weeks after the burning stopped. There were those who died instantly, and there were also those who languished in brief agony. These included actress Midori Naka, the first person to have her cause of death officially listed as radiation poisoning. Naka, who was rescued from the remains of a destroyed building, survived the initial blast on August 6th. By August 16th, she was in the hospital with open sores, hair loss, and a rapidly dropping white blood count. On August 24th, she was dead. Naka became the first of many radiation victims autopsied by the Japanese government in an attempt to learn more about radiation sickness and hopefully treat survivors. But here's where it gets worse. American medical professionals showed up at the end of September, and although the two nations initially worked together, all the material became mixed up. Body parts and glass jars of wet specimens were collected and sent back to the U.S., but names were changed to case numbers, organs were sliced and studied, identities disappeared when shipments were mislabeled and shuffled. By the early 1950s, no one could tell if the specimens had come from the same person. The American Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, set up to study survivors, continued to collect body parts for years. We were used as a guinea pig twice, first as a target, second as an object of medical research. The American Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission were viewed as body snatchers, with one man, Association of Atomic Victims founder Kiyoshi Kikawa, calling the organization a corpse production facility. You now have an American scientific institution which is funded by the Atomic Energy Commission, which is operating in a foreign country. It wasn't until 1955 that the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology was opened, with the goal of consolidating the remains collected from the bomb victims. Record-keeping was iffy at best. Japan was outraged and started calling for the remains to be returned. That didn't happen until May 1973, when Japan received seven massive crates filled with photos, pieces of clothing, even organs, brains, and eyes preserved in formaldehyde. All told, there were around 23,000 such items returned. University of Pennsylvania's Susan Lindy writes that, The body parts appeared in Japan as both national property and crucial scientific data. Japanese pathologists were just as eager to study, slice, and display these pieces of human bodies. Among the findings over the years, thyroid cancer and leukemia are the first to strike. Solid cancers come 10 to 30 years later. In 1946, an unnamed man appealed to the mayor of Hiroshima asking for the construction of a space that would be used to honor those who died in the bombing. This became the Atomic Bomb Memorial Mound, a 16-ton dome of earth topped by a small pagoda. It stands on the site of a former Buddhist temple that served as a makeshift crematorium in the aftermath of the bombs. Today, the ashes of 70,000 people rest within the mound's underground vault, along with the remains of many who were discovered in the months of cleanup that followed. That includes the remains of 12 American soldiers who had been shot down over Japan, taken to Hiroshima for questioning, and were being held there when the bomb dropped. Where the bomb fell is a peace park. The city of Hiroshima says that all of those 70,000 people were unclaimed, most often because entire families perished. Others are unidentified, although DNA testing has led to the identification of some of the remains. Occasionally, more people are interred there. In 2004, 85 sets of remains were discovered on Ninoshima Island and were given a final resting place in the Memorial Mound. Even as scores of people flocked to the cities to care for the dead and dying, some families were left to their own devices when it came to seeing their loved ones die and giving them a proper final resting place. Yoshiro Yamawaki was 11 years old when he survived the atomic bombing of Nagasaki and told Time, One incident I will never forget is cremating my father. He and his brothers found their father dead at a nearby factory, and laying his nearly unrecognizable body down, they attempted a cremation. You have many nightmares about that. After the fire had gone out, he wasn't entirely cremated. In an attempt to give his spirit peace, the brothers decided to observe an old funeral tradition where a bone was passed around with chopsticks. 
As soon as our chopsticks touched the surface, however, the skull cracked open like plaster and his half-cremated brain spilled out. My brothers and I screamed and ran away, leaving our father behind. We abandoned him in the worst state possible. Some of the most infamous images of the aftermath of the dropping of the atomic bombs are the shadows etched on sidewalks and pavement around the cities. They are often said to be the shadows created as people were vaporized in their last moments on Earth. But according to Dr. Michael Hartshorn of the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History and the University of New Mexico School of Medicine, there's something else entirely. The dark spots are places that were protected from the heat and light of the intense blast because it was absorbed by the people who had been standing there. It isn't the darkened shadows that were changed by the bomb, it was everything else around it, which was bleached in the light of the blast. Hartshorn says that there were probably a lot more of the horrific images created in the aftermath of the blast, as everybody absorbed the energy of the blast and shielded whatever was behind them, but most were destroyed in the following shockwaves, fires, and heat blasts. The skeleton of a single building bears witness to what happened here. Accounts of the immediate aftermath of the dropping of the atomic bomb are as varied as the lives of those who tell them. Still, read enough of them and something stands out. Stories of people crying out for water and dying after taking just a sip. Uh, people were burned, suffering, and then, you know, begging for a drink of water. Rikuko Sasaki told of seeing people go to the rivers on Mount Hijiyama, holding out their hands and asking for water. Someone told her that if they were given any, they would die. Her neighbor died anyway. Inosuke Hayasaki told of walking away from Nagasaki and passing countless burn victims, all pleading for water. Knowing many had only a brief time to live, he started bringing water to the victims from a nearby rice paddy. Among them was his friend, Yamada. In an interview with Time, he remembered, I placed my hand on his chest. His skin slid right off, exposing his flesh. I was mortified. Water, he murmured. I rang the water over his mouth. Five minutes later, he was dead. He lived with the burden of not knowing if, in his attempt at mercy, he had killed him. Did he? No, not necessarily. According to Dr. Hiro Odohi of the Hiroshima Red Cross Hospital and Atomic Bomb Survivors Hospital, drinking water could lead to more blood loss in severely wounded people, but at that point, they were likely dying anyway. In 1946, the Manhattan Engineer District compiled a report of all that was known about the aftermath of the atomic bomb. They determined that in the case of immediate deaths, only about 7% were caused by radiation. In fact, casualties from radiation were restricted to the immediate blast radius. While severe burns caused mass casualties as far away from the epicenter as 2.6 miles. The report found that there was a shocking 93% mortality rate for those who were within 1,000 feet of the epicenter of the bomb, and that didn't drop below 50% until they started looking at casualties around 5,000 feet. They also estimated that 60% of the deaths from Hiroshima were caused by burns, 30% caused by falling debris. At Nagasaki, however, that jumped to a whopping 95% of deaths caused by burns. They clarified further that there were two different kinds of burns, flash burns and flame burns. Flame burns were caused by fire. Flash burns were much more devious, starting as reddened skin and worsening over the next few hours. The exposure of a flash burn is a few thousands of a second, and although any kind of shielding would prevent them, even some kinds of clothing, these were the burns that charred telephone poles, destroyed granite surfaces, and boiled roof tiles. Various organizations have tracked the health of survivors since the atomic bombs were dropped, and their findings have been dismal. Science reports high instances of illnesses like cancer and leukemia, with survivors suffering from a myriad of other issues like anemia, tumors, thyroid issues, and miscarriages, along with struggles like survivor's guilt. While those are generally well known, there are less frequent but no less heartbreaking conditions that some survivors and their families have faced. Yasujiro Tanaka told Time that not only did he lose most of his hearing, but his skin continues to grow random scabs. His sister's kidney issues make dialysis a thrice-weekly process, and about 10 years after the bombing, glass began growing out of his mother's skin where it had been embedded by the blast. Fujio Torakoshi lives with a thick scar called a keloid on his neck, and he's not alone. Some survivors have developed so much scar tissue that they struggle to perform basic tasks. A study published in the journal Epidemiology and Psychiatric Sciences looked at suicide risk among survivors and determined that mental health care was as important as physical care. Sachiko Matsuo's father died horribly in the aftermath of the bomb, and it was 50 years before he appeared to her in her dreams. She told Time that, He was wearing a kimono and smiling ever so slightly. Although we did not exchange words, I knew at that moment that he was safe in heaven. It's not terribly surprising that when infamous serial killers die, they're often not buried in a typical cemetery. So where do the remains end up? 
That's what we're here to find out, so keep watching to discover what happened to the bodies of these serial killers. Charles Manson died on November 19, 2017, and there was a laundry list of people who wanted legal rights to both his remains and his estate. It wasn't until March 2018 that a California judge decided that Jason Freeman, Manson's grandson, would receive the body. As Freeman told CNN, This is unreal. This is something I actually played out in my mind ever since I was a kid. I've approached it as um, doing the right thing uh for a family member. Freeman also noted that he was going to have his grandfather's body cremated after a small ceremony. Manson was given a ceremony overseen by a pastor of the Church of the Nazarene with about 20 people in attendance, including one-time Manson family member Sandra Good. Freeman had originally said that his intentions were to scatter his grandfather's ashes, but some weird things have happened since then. In 2019, Rolling Stone reported that some of Manson's ashes had been included in a set of masks made by the artist Ryan Almighty, who had once painted a portrait of Manson using human blood. And in 2021, Vice reported that some of Manson's ashes had been kept by a friend of Freeman's named Tony Miller, who then distributed them to Ryan Almighty, who used them as part of the client's Helter Skelter face tattoo. Even if serial killers are found guilty and sentenced to the death penalty, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be executed. Consider the case of Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker or the Valley Intruder. His killing spree happened in the mid-1980s, and in 1989, he was given the death penalty. But he died before his execution could be carried out. That was in 2013, and the cause was complications from B-cell lymphoma. At the time, Ramirez was still married to a woman named Doreen Leoy, who he met after his conviction. She believed in his innocence for a long time and even went on record as saying, I think he's a really great person. He's my best friend. He's my buddy. I just believe him completely. Considering that sentiment, you might think that Leoy would have claimed Ramirez's body and given him a proper burial. That's not exactly what happened. According to his niece Shelly, his body actually went unclaimed for weeks. It wasn't clear where Leoy was, but at the time of his death, he'd reportedly had no visitors for several years, which was quite a change from Leoy's previous four times per week visitation schedule. San Quentin officials said that if his body went unclaimed for long enough, he would be cremated, and that's reportedly exactly what happened. Between 1974 and 1978, Ted Bundy killed more than 30 people, often using his good looks and charm to lure good Samaritans to their deaths. He was ultimately executed on January 24, 1989. He had actually gotten the death penalty for three separate trials, though he ended up spending nine years in prison before he was sent to the electric chair at the Florida State Penitentiary. When he was taken out of the prison, the crowds lining the streets outside cheered as the car bearing his body drove past. He made eye contact with people in the front row. You know, he spoke to them. He was cognizant of what was going on about him. Bundy's brain was examined for physical explanations that might give researchers a clue as to why he'd been driven to kill so many people in such terrible ways. But alas, it had none of the abnormalities or signs of trauma that scientists expected to see. Afterwards, Bundy's very eerie final request was fulfilled. He was cremated, and his ashes were returned to Washington State, where they were scattered in the Cascade Mountains. That might not sound too creepy, but that's where he had disposed of at least four of his victims. John Wayne Gacy ultimately confessed to killing 33 people over the course of about six years in the mid-1970s. He was executed by lethal injection in 1994. What happened afterwards is partially up for debate. Gacy was cremated, and the debatable part is whether or not his ashes were actually given to his sister, as is often claimed. That's not even the weirdest part of the story. In 2004, psychiatrist Helen Morrison revealed in an interview with CNN that she had Gacy's brain stored safely in her basement for the previous decade, and also that she preserved slices of his organs as well. Morrison had spent much of her career studying serial killers, and she'd been in touch with Gacy the decade prior to his execution. She claimed that he'd wanted her to have his brain, so she'd been there for his autopsy, and then she'd just simply took the brain with her when she left. According to her, this was perfectly normal, and she kept it in the hopes that new techniques would be developed to study it further. In the 1960s, a single serial killer was linked to 11 victims across Massachusetts. He was nicknamed the Boston Strangler, but that's a bit of a misnomer. The victims were so spread out that five different district attorney's offices were involved in the investigation. The case remained unsolved for quite a while. Fast forward a bit to the arrest of Albert DeSalvo. After his conviction for rape, he confessed that he was also the Boston Strangler. While he did know a lot about the case, it wasn't long before he recanted his confession. Then in 1973, he ended up dead in his jail cell under circumstances that have never been completely explained. The case became rather cold after that for a few more decades. Then in 2013, police were able to match DNA evidence from the Strangler's last victim to DeSalvo's nephew, Tim. The match was close enough that law enforcement were able to get a court order to exhume DeSalvo's body from where it had been buried in a Peabody, Massachusetts 
Massachusetts cemetery. Within days, another DNA match had given law enforcement a, quote, unprecedented level of certainty that Albert DeSalvo had in fact been the Boston Strangler. Jeffrey Dahmer's parents have spoken out about what it is like to have a convicted serial killer for a son. His father, Lionel, even wrote a book about it. Dahmer himself was killed in 1994 by a fellow inmate who later said he'd pretty much done everyone a favor, as Dahmer reportedly liked to sneak up on fellow inmates and remind them, I bite. In the immediate aftermath of Dahmer's death, he was taken for an autopsy and his brain was removed and preserved. The idea was that it was going to be studied by experts in abnormal behavior, but Dahmer's parents were at odds over whether or not they wanted that to happen. He was torn between the two parents. He was a lost child. Around the same time, Dahmer's body, which had been kept on ice until the trial of the man who killed him, was cremated and his ashes were divided between his parents. Dahmer's mother, Joyce Flint, continued to petition to have her son's brain studied to see if there were physical or biological reasons for his crimes, but that wasn't destined to happen, as a judge ultimately ruled in the favor of Dahmer's father, who said that he was hoping to maintain his son's final wishes. Dahmer's brain was then ordered to be cremated as well. Between 1963 and 1965, five children disappeared from the Manchester, England area. In 1965, a man named David Smith went to the police and told them that he just witnessed his sister-in-law, Myra Hindley, and her boyfriend, Ian Brady, killing a 17-year-old boy with an axe. In a highly publicized trial, the so-called Moores murders were both found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Hindley died in 2002 of respiratory failure with suspected strokes and heart attacks. After becoming a devout Catholic, she left final wishes that she was under no circumstances to become an organ donor, and that she was to be cremated and her ashes scattered secretly. All of that reportedly did happen. After a brief private Catholic service, she was cremated and her ashes were taken by a single police officer. He was sworn to secrecy and entrusted with disposing of them in private. As for Brady, he died in 2017 of heart failure and lung disease. Even though he'd requested a formal funeral and the playing of a classical music piece, a judge ruled that none of that would happen. There had also been rumors that Brady was going to be cremated and his ashes spread in the same place that he'd buried his victims. Ultimately, he was cremated and his ashes were dumped somewhere at sea. Ed Gein's story has been told and retold so many times. Nowadays, he's typically overshadowed by all the fictional killers based on it. But when he died in 1984, he'd been living peacefully and quietly for years at the Mendota Mental Health Institute in Madison, Wisconsin. Gein's official cause of death was complications from cancer, and he was buried alongside his mother and brother in their family plot at the Plainfield Cemetery in Plainfield, Wisconsin. It could be argued that this was in questionable taste, considering that this was the same cemetery where he exhumed an unknown number of graves in order to find body parts for his infamous home furnishings. Gein's grave is unmarked as his headstone was stolen in 2000. It turned up the following year in Seattle as the centerpiece of a punk music and art show called the Angry White Male Tour. Tour organizer Shane Bugby, who is also the founder of the official Ed Gein fan club, insisted that it was fake, but it was quickly determined to be real. Bugby later claimed he was, quote, providing a service to the stone and it was never returned. Gein's grave is still unmarked. When Eileen Warnos was executed by lethal injection in 2002, she reportedly wanted it to happen, according to her childhood best friend, Don Botkins. Warnos and Botkins grew up together in Michigan, and they remained close throughout Warnos' trial and imprisonment. Botkins claimed to always have some sympathy for Warnos, as she knew about the horrific abuse she suffered as they were growing up. Nevertheless, it's still surprising that Botkins took charge of Warnos' remains, especially considering that she told Vice in 2016, of course she should be executed. She killed seven men. I wouldn't have it any other way. Originally, Warnos had told Botkins that she wanted her ashes spread on Flagler's Beach in Florida, but Botkins refused, believing that absolutely no one wanted her in Florida, much less on the beach. Instead, Botkins convinced Warnos to agree to let her take her ashes home with her. She did that, and a walnut tree marks the spot. While most doctors pledged to do no harm, Harold Shipman did exactly the opposite. When he went to trial in 1999, he was one of the world's most prolific serial killers. He was ultimately charged with 15 murders and connected to around 250 suspicious deaths. In January 2004, Shipman hanged himself in his jail cell. It took more than a year for his body to be released to his family. His wife was advised to cremate him so that his burial place wouldn't be targeted by vandals. So she did, but with some difficulty. At least one funeral home refused to provide services, and when he he was finally cremated and happened in the middle of the night. It was later reported that Shipman's ashes were scattered in secret, but that's not quite the end of the story. It turns out that his wife received 100,000 pounds up front from his insurance policy, and she continues to receive 10,000 pounds per year afterwards, which was part of the policy only if he died before he reached 60 years old. He was 58 when he took his own life. 
The sinking of the RMS Titanic is one of the most famous stories in maritime history, thanks in part to James Cameron's iconic 1997 movie. The RMS Titanic was a luxurious steamship that boasted top-of-the-range facilities, decked with fine furniture and state-of-the-art equipment for the time. The second and third class accommodations weren't bad either, and provided entertainment areas and comfortable rooms for those who couldn't afford first-class tickets. But just before midnight on April 14, 1912, the Titanic struck an iceberg. It tore into the side of the ship, causing seawater to flood into six of its 16 watertight compartments. Just a few hours later, the Titanic was swallowed by the ocean, finally going down in the early morning of April 15th. The Titanic had a total of 20 lifeboats on board, more than the required number by the Board of Trade, but definitely not enough to rescue all the passengers and crew. The ship had approximately 2,200 people on board when it sank, and those 20 lifeboats could only carry 1,178 people. To add to that, the evacuation was hasty and disorganized due to panic and some lifeboats were released without even reaching full capacity. All in all, only 705 people were able to escape the sinking ship. The rest died in the frigid waters of the Atlantic, while others went down with the Titanic when it sank to the bottom of the ocean. The whole world stood still that night. Once the lights had gone, the ship had gone, the sound had gone. That was dreadful. The C.S. Mackay Bennett from Halifax, Nova Scotia was tasked to retrieve dead bodies following the sinking. Halifax was the major port closest to the location of Titanic sinking, and even then it took four days for the ship to reach the site. The Mackay Bennett was loaded with ice, wooden coffins, and embalming fluid. The ship's captain, Frederick Harold Larnder, described the scene and said that the bodies looked, quote, like a flock of seagulls. The Mackay Bennett spent a week searching the sites and surrounding areas for bodies. After considerable effort, they were able to recover three 306 victims. Three other ships from Halifax were sent to the site, and they were able to recover 22 additional bodies, while other steamers that just happened to pass by the site recovered five more. The rescue ship Carpathia recovered four. Of the 300-plus bodies recovered, 119 were buried at sea. This is because they had been found after the embalming fluid ran out, while other bodies were beyond recognition. These bodies were wrapped in cloth and then strapped to weights to make them sink to the bottom of the ocean. Roughly 1,500 people died when the Titanic sank, and of that number, approximately 1,160 bodies were never recovered, making the vast ocean their final resting place. After the recovery efforts, the ships containing the dead bodies docked at Halifax. Curious onlookers were gathered at the docks to watch as the bodies were transported from the ship to the waterfront. Halifax had been chosen as the location best suitable for bringing the dead, as the bodies could easily be transported from that location to other cities by train or ship if needed. Halifax mourned the loss of lives by putting black crepe in windows and flying flags at half-mast. Of the bodies that were recovered, 150 were buried in three different cemeteries in Halifax. Those who were identified were given headstones by their families, while unidentified victims had simple headstones saying they died on the Titanic. More than 25% of those buried in Halifax remain nameless, but that doesn't stop locals from offering tributes by leaving items on their graves. Attempts have been made to identify some of these victims, however. In 2019, Titanic expert Bill Willard attempted to test the remains of the unknown individuals in order to finally identify them. While the British Titanic Society approved the proposal, some graveyard authorities where victims are buried refused the test, saying that the dead should be left to rest in peace. Previous to that, in 2001, the so-called unknown child had been identified as Sidney Goodwin, who was just 19 months old when the Titanic sank. Royals spend their lives being treated in weird ways, and sometimes when they die, it just gets even weirder. Joanna of Castile took her husband's body out to dinner, Richard I had his parts spread around the world, and Anne of Brittany's heart was just stolen. Literally. William the Conqueror might have a cool name now, but as a kid he was known as William the Bastard. Despite this unflattering sobriquet, he was still a feared member of the aristocracy who fought many enemies and successfully invaded England. It's enough to make anyone hungry, and William certainly was, as he ate himself to a truly remarkable size. There's nothing wrong with being large, but in this case, it directly killed William. While off fighting more enemies in 1087, the king was stabbed in the stomach by his own saddle horn and ruptured his intestines. It took him six weeks to die. You'd think that would be long enough to plan a funeral fit for a king, but instead, the second he was dead, virtually everyone from the servants to the aristocrats fled. Writer Orderic Vitalis recorded in his Historia Ecclesiastia that the king's body was left almost naked on the floor of the house, as if he had been a barbarian. The few people who remained buried William, but at the funeral, things got so much worse. As Orderic explained in a later writing, 
When the corpse was placed in the sarcophagus and was forcibly doubled up because the masons had carelessly made the coffin too short and narrow, the swollen bowels burst, and an intolerable stench assailed the nostrils of the bystanders and the whole crowd. A thick smoke arose from the frankincense and other spices in the censers, but it was not strong enough to conceal the foul ignominy. In other words, he exploded. Sabata Dainland Yebo was the paramount chief of the Temba people, who occupied an area of South Africa that was supposedly independent from the all-white apartheid state. While that sounds kinda like a good thing, these areas were carved out by the apartheid government, and the African National Congress as well as Chief Sabata were extremely opposed to them. The chief was outspoken about his support of a South Africa where every person was equal. This made him a concern for the government, especially when he died in 1986. They knew his funeral would be used as a large-scale protest against apartheid. It wasn't in fact even a funeral to most of us. It was a, a political rally. So they stole the chief's body. Not only was the corpse stolen, but it was taken by Chief Sabata's arch nemesis, whom the Los Angeles Times says he referred to as a usurper, scoundrel, and traitor. The government hastily buried Chief Sabata, and the people were incensed. The chief's son asked, what crime is more despicable than stealing a man's body from his grieving family? And when a chief is buried like a pauper, then it is a crime against the whole nation, not just against his family. Winnie Mandela, the activist and wife of Nelson Mandela, said of the government's burial, It really seems even in his death, the late king was a detainee. The king was virtually turned into a prisoner in his coffin. It wasn't until 1989 that Chief Sabata received an elaborate funeral. Francis' famous Louis XIV, the Sun King, died in 1715. He was buried in the traditional location for the country's royals, Paris's Basilica of Saint-Denis. When anti-monarchy mobs revolted in France in 1789, one of their targets was the Basilica, where the royal tombs were looted and destroyed. Westminster Abbey claims Louis XIV's heart was taken from the tomb by a member of the English aristocratic family, Harcourts. They brought it to Britain, and in the mid-1800s, the heart would have a fateful run-in with a man named William Buckland. Buckland was a geologist, fossil hunter, and noted next-level eccentric. Buckland's main weird quirk was that he wanted to eat everything at least once. When invited to a dinner at the Harcourt residence, Buckland was shown the family's treasure, Louis XIV's preserved and shrunken heart in a silver box. Instead of politely doing whatever you're supposed to do when shown a dead king's heart, Buckland promptly grabbed it, put it in his mouth, and swallowed it, saying, I have eaten many strange things, but I have never eaten the heart of a king before. Charles I was the only English monarch to be executed. After disagreements with Parliament, which resulted in the English Civil War, Charles was put on trial and convicted of treason against his own people. Since treason was a death penalty crime, that meant Parliament was in the awkward and unprecedented position of executing the king. There were legitimate worries about how this would play out. While the politicians had their reasons for not liking the king, the regular people didn't necessarily agree. The execution would take place in public, although attempts were made to keep the number of observers down to a minimum. On January 30, 1649, Charles was led to the scaffold. He spoke to the crowd, but the presence of loud drummers at the execution ensured that he could not be heard. Then he laid his neck on the block. An anonymous observer recorded what happened next. After a very short pause, His Majesty stretching forth his hands, the executioner at one blow severed his head from his body, which, being held up and showed to the people, was with his body put in a coffin covered with black velvet and carried into his lodging. How would the crowd react now the horrible deed was done? It turns out really morbidly. The account continues. His blood was taken up by diverse persons for different ends, by some as trophies of their villainy, by others as relics of a martyr. In other words, they dipped things in his blood as souvenirs. Blood? Blood. Crimson, copper-smelling blood. His blood. 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 Although Anne of Brittany only lived to be 36 years old, she still managed to become Queen of France twice in that time. She was originally married to Charles VIII when she was 12, and after he died, she married his heir, which fortunately wasn't as gross as it could be since Louis XII was only Charles' second cousin once removed. When Anne died in 1514, she was buried in the traditional tomb of the French royal family at the Basilica of Saint-Denis, but asked for her heart to lie next to her parents in Brittany. It was put in a gold case and even managed to avoid being destroyed during the French Revolution, when anything royal the mobs could get their hands on was trashed. So it was especially upsetting when, in 2018, thieves stole the heart from the Thomas Dobry Museum in Nantes. People were shocked, 
Philippe Grovalet, president of the group that oversees the museum, said the thieves attacked our common heritage and stole an item of inestimable value. Much more than a symbol, the case containing the heart of Anne of Brittany belongs to our history. He asked them to come to their senses. If thieves were motivated by the fact that it is shiny and made of gold, they should understand that its historical and symbolic value far outweighs its 100 grams of gold. The BBC reports that, thankfully, the heart was found safe and intact a month later. When you go down in history as Philip the Handsome, you know you've done well for yourself. Philip, Duke of Burgundy, married Joanna of Castile in 1496, but he cheated on his wife constantly. This made her jealous and unhappy, and then Philip died. This didn't stop Joanna's obsessive love for her husband, and one historian at the Spanish court at the time said she suffered from the same jealousy that tormented her during her husband's life. After his death, it's said that she would take his coffin with her everywhere, even eating next to it at dinner. A chronicler recorded that she would visit her husband's body every day, kissing the corpse's feet, driven, quote, to the point of love madness. The good queen had no more profit or repose than a woman damned or deranged. This is the old school way of looking at what happened to Joanna, which earned her the sobriquet Joanna la Loca, or Joanna the Mad. The men around her wrote down how she completely cracked. The poor weak lady couldn't handle her husband's death and did gross stuff with his corpse. But revisionist historians are taking another look. People, including her own father, were always trying to overthrow Joanna, and by keeping her husband's body near her, she may have been using it as a symbol both of her power and the legitimacy and rights of her children. Rather than being an unstable woman who was unable to deal with her loss, she might have been calmly and coldly defending her throne, using the corpse as a weapon. <gasps> that rules! Richard I, aka Richard the Lionheart, is famous for being King of England probably because of the many times he's mentioned in the Robin Hood tales. But in reality, Richard wasn't in England all that much. He had land in France he liked, plus he was always off fighting one crusade or another. But it was while combining these two loves and fighting some enemies in France that he was shot with a crossbow bolt and died. Sometimes important people in the Middle Ages would have their heart buried separately from their body. Richard actually had three bits of his body buried in completely different locations. But despite this, they were all in France. He couldn't even spare a peaky toe for poor England. Richard's body is in the Fontereau Abbey. His entrails went to the chapel in Charru, and his heart was taken to the Rouen Cathedral. Over 800 years after Richard died in 1199, scientists analyzed this heart and found it had been embalmed using ingredients that, as the Daily Beast notes, would have cost a pretty penny. According to the BBC, French forensic scientist Philippe Charlier explained, The spices and vegetables used for the embalming process were directly inspired by the ones used for the embalming of Christ. For example, we found frankincense. This is the only case known of using frankincense. The consciousness of using very high-quality herbs and spices and other materials that are much sought after and rare does add to the sense of it being Christ-like in its quality. Samuel Pepys was a relatively middle-management courtier to Charles II, but his name has gone down in history because he was very, very good at writing in his diary, and he might have said too much. In 1669, he wrote of a family outing to Westminster Abbey, where they got a tour of the royal tombs. This included that of Catherine of Valois, the 15th-century French wife of Henry V. The tomb was broken, and they could see her corpse exposed, skeletal with scraps of leathery flesh. This isn't surprising, but what Samuel Pepys did with the corpse is. Telling on himself in his own words, he wrote, I had the upper part of her body in my hands, and I did kiss her mouth, reflecting upon that I did kiss a queen, and that this was my birthday, 36 years old, that I did first kiss a queen. That's certainly one way to treat yourself on your birthday. Samuel Pepys has been dead since 1703, but still, if you ever see him, call the cops. What a creep. The 16th century Portuguese poet Luiz Vaz de Camões called Inés de Castro the one who, after being killed, was queen. In the 1400s, Pedro I, the heir to the Portuguese throne, met Inés and fell madly in love, but his dad, King Alfonso, made him marry someone else. But Pedro refused to stop seeing Inés, having kids with both her and his wife. To solve this problem, the king had Inés killed. After Pedro inherited the throne, he wanted his children with Inez and not his wife to be his heirs, so he claimed that he and Inez secretly got hitched before he was officially married. This would make him a bigamist, but he was king, so everyone let it go. Regardless, Pedro used this claim to make his kids legitimate, which meant Inez had been the real queen the whole time. 
Now, the rest of this is just legend and didn't appear in any records until the 1500s, according to Google Arts and Culture. It said that Pedro dug up Inez, sat her on the throne, and made the whole court kiss the hem of her skirt as a sign of fealty to her. Other sources, like the Encyclopedia Britannica, say a crown was placed on her head and the courtiers had to kiss her hand. While it's probably apocryphal, if any part of it is true, it's definitely one of the weirdest things ever done to a royal after they died. A stolen presidential brain? That's just one of the weird things that's happened to a president's body after dying. Before George Washington died in 1799, he made his will and was quite clear on where and how he wanted to be buried. According to the official website to the First President's Virginia Plantation, Mount Vernon, he wanted to stay close to home, but he wasn't happy with the current options. He explained, The family vault at Mount Vernon requiring repairs and being improperly situated besides, I desire that a new one of brick and upon a larger scale may be built at the foot of what is commonly called the vineyard enclosure, in which my remains may be deposited. That didn't happen at first. Washington's wishes were completely ignored by Congress and his widow and a crypt was planned under the U.S. Capitol building. But by 1830, that hadn't happened. So Washington's remains were still in the old rundown crypt he'd said needed fixing more than 30 years before. Then, as explained in Stealing Lincoln's Body, John Augustine Washington II, who was George Washington's heir, fired a gardener at Mount Vernon. In retaliation, the gardener decided to steal the late president's skull. However, the tomb was in such bad shape that the bones of around 20 people were scattered all over and mixed together meaning the gardener ended up with the skull of one of Washington's distant relatives. After that, a new tomb was erected within a year. In order to understand how weird John Tyler's post-life situation was, you need to know two things. He was a Southerner, and he died in 1862. That meant that in the middle of the Civil War, the 10th President of the United States was a citizen of the Confederacy. In the New York Times obituary for Tyler, the author did not hold back on how the ex-president was a traitor, reminding readers that after secession, Tyler had been elected to the Confederacy's legislature. The scathing obituary continued, He ended his life suddenly last Friday in Richmond, going down to death amid the ruins of his native state. He himself was one of the architects of its ruin, and beneath that melancholy wreck his name will be buried instead of being inscribed on the Capitol's monumental marble, as a year ago he so much desired. Tyler was laid to rest in Richmond's Hollywood Cemetery. Their official page explains that despite his expressed wishes for a simple funeral, President Jefferson Davis made quite the statement by draping Tyler's coffin in a Confederate flag. As a result, Tyler's death wound up being the only presidential passing not officially recognized in Washington, D.C., and he was the only president buried beneath a different flag. Zachary Taylor, the 12th President of the United States, is definitely one of the lesser-known ones. Despite his unremarkable presidency, his death managed to be so weird that people were still obsessing about it almost a century and a half after he died in 1850. Taylor died a little over a year into his first term, at the age of 65. While this was a ripe old age in the mid-19th century, Taylor had been fine only days earlier. Politico says that he even attended a 4th of July ceremony. Five days later, he was dead. Immediately, some people theorized he'd been poisoned. The motive, so the conspiracy theory goes, was to get Taylor out of the way because he didn't want slavery to become legal in the country's western territories. So, rumor was that pro-slavery people poisoned the milk and cherries he ate at the Independence Day party. This was such a prominent conspiracy that, just to find out once and for all, in 1991, the body of the former president was exhumed. After lots of scientific tests, it turned out there was no poison. Kentucky's chief medical examiner explained that they found evidence of a myriad of natural diseases, which could have produced the symptoms of gastroenteritis. The assassination of President Abraham Lincoln was a shock, and for a nation that had just been through a civil war, the upheaval and grief must have seemed almost impossible to process. One can't help but think of all the good we could do if we had more time. Limitless time. In an era with no mass media, the Washington Post reports it was decided that Lincoln's body would go on an extensive journey around the country, giving people the chance to process and grieve, up close and personal. Lincoln's body was embalmed, something that had only just come to the public's attention due to soldiers being embalmed for shipment home when they died on the Civil War battlefields. But the technology was not yet perfected, and Lincoln's corpse was about to go through a lot. What followed was 19 days in an unsealed coffin traveling on a train, being moved for public viewing in 13 different cities. Even today, that would be asking a lot of an embalmer. Back then, the embalmer had to travel with Lincoln's body and re-embalm it at every stop, just to give the chemical facade a chance of working. Based on the reviews from the time, it didn't. The New York Times wrote about Lincoln's body when the funeral train stopped in that city and predicted, 
It will not be possible, despite the affection of the embalming, to continue much longer the exhibition, as the constant shaking of the body, aided by the exposure to the air and the increasing of dust, has already undone much of the workmanship. The strange odyssey of Abraham Lincoln's corpse wasn't over after his very long funeral journey ended and he was finally entombed in a marble sarcophagus in an Illinois cemetery. Turns out, in 1876, some rap scallions thought they would nip in and grab the body, then ransom it off for $200,000. He should, uh, you know, not be pointing at me during this particular line because it's a f sort of aggressive. As U.S. News & World Report explains, this was a lot easier than you think. There were no guards at the tomb, and the sarcophagus itself had just been lightly sealed and secured with one regular padlock despite grave robbing and body snatching still being a common occurrence. Even though stealing Lincoln's body should have been easy, the gang of Chicago counterfeiters behind the planned crime managed to blow it by asking a government informant for help. When they got to the tomb, Secret Service agents were watching from out of sight. The men filed through the padlock and were attempting to open the heavy cover of the sarcophagus when a gunshot from outside made them scatter. In order that Lincoln would not risk being corpse snatched by criminals who were better at their job, the president was secretly buried in the tomb's basement. Finally, in 1901, he was dug up again and buried in a steel cage 10 feet deep under tons of concrete. In 1923, President Warren G. Harding was relaxing with his wife Florence in a San Francisco hotel when he suddenly dropped dead. Although he wasn't feeling well on a stressful cross-country speaking tour and got food poisoning, he wasn't suddenly stopped living sick. Despite the fact that the sitting president of the United States had died for no obvious reason, PBS reports his widow refused an autopsy and insisted her husband be embalmed immediately. The presiding doctors were furious, with one writing, We shall never know exactly the immediate cause of President Harding's death since every effort that was made to secure an autopsy met with complete and final refusal. The public first blamed the doctors, but in 1930, a former Harding administration official slash con man with a grudge wrote a book making an outlandish claim about why Florence made these weird decisions. She poisoned her husband, probably because he was constantly cheating on her. According to the New York Times, Harding had an affair with a woman named Nan Britton, which produced a child. But considering there wasn't any way to be sure back then, it was just an allegation. Now, oh, history will only remember you and your lake-based erotic poetry. <laughs> well, actually, they will remember one more thing. In 2020, that child's child wanted to prove he was Harding's grandson, because even though there was ancestry and DNA evidence, some of Harding's legitimate descendants questioned it. However, once exhumation became a possibility, the holdouts relented and said there was no need to dig up the late president. Franklin D. Roosevelt was a very ill man when he died in 1945, having served three terms as president and seen the country through the Great Depression and World War II. But even though he was obviously unwell, his actual death was sudden. According to Till Death Did Us Part, the story of the health and death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president was at one of his vacation homes when he said he had what he described as a terrific pain in the back of my head, passed out. He would die three hours later. Time was of the essence, since embalming works best the sooner it's done to a body. However, in Roosevelt's case, the undertaker wasn't even contacted until four hours after Roosevelt died, and then they had to wait until Eleanor Roosevelt showed up since she was the next of kin. It had been nine hours when they finally began the embalming process, and as the undertaker F. Hayden Snodderly recorded in great detail afterwards, there were lots of issues which made getting the embalming fluid into his veins almost impossible. With the time element, you can readily understand and realize what a difficult case we had to prepare. Rumors circulated that Roosevelt hadn't been able to be embalmed at all because he had been poisoned and his body turned black. Despite this accusation appearing in a book in 1948, it's not true. If you, like thousands of people every year, go visit John F. Kennedy's grave in Arlington National Cemetery, just know that you aren't standing on top of all of him. The body in the grave is missing a key bit, the brain. Even worse, no one actually knows where it is. So how did someone lose the brain of one of the United States' most famous and revered presidents? Well, after JFK was assassinated in 1963, his body was autopsied, and the brain was placed in a stainless steel container with a screw-top lid, which was then stored in a file cabinet in the office of the Secret Service. From there, it was placed in a footlocker and brought to a secure room in the National Archives. This must have made sense to someone, but then, according to James Swanson, author of End of Days, The Assassination of John F. Kennedy, in October 1966, it was discovered that the brain, the tissue slides, and other autopsy materials were missing, and they have never been seen since. 
This is obviously a conspiracy theorist's dream, but Swanson's reasoning on why the brain disappeared might shock even them. He suggested, My conclusion is that Robert Kennedy did take his brother's brain, not to conceal evidence of a conspiracy, but perhaps to conceal evidence of the true extent of President Kennedy's illnesses, or perhaps to conceal evidence of the number of medications that President Kennedy was taking. I'm calling it. Yeah. It's 1 p.m. John Harrison wasn't a U.S. president, but he was the ultimate U.S. president adjacent person. He was the son of the ninth president, William Henry Harrison, and the father of the 23rd president, Benjamin Harrison. And unfortunately for the then future president, Benjamin, something weird happened to his father's body after he died. John was 73 when he died in 1878, three years before Benjamin was elected. Cincinnati Magazine reports that the Harrison family had learned about a grave in the cemetery that had been robbed recently, and the body of a man named Augustus Devon was stolen. To be sure, that wouldn't happen to John, they buried him with extraordinary precautions, topped off with a guard watching over the grave for a full month. After the funeral, Benjamin and his brother decided to help out the Devons and search local medical schools for Augustus' body, but they'd get more than they bargained for. At one college, they noticed a rope going down a shaft and realized the body was on the other end, so they pulled it up. In a New York Times article, Benjamin is alleged to have revealed, Attached to the rope by a hook was the body of my own father. They had known at the college whose the body was. They had taken this fiendishly ingenious method of moving it from floor to floor as we in our search had moved from one floor to another. Somehow, John Harrison had been removed from his grave, and Benjamin Harrison was the one to find it.